Hello and welcome to Security Scan. I am Vishal Dahiya and this week we will take up the issue of India's fifth generation fighter aircraft project. <music> India has recently conveyed to Russia that it will not be a part of the project now to develop a fifth generation fighter aircraft that is FGFA and may join the program at a later stage. India's decision has come after years of negotiations between the two countries could not yield concrete results on various contentious issues, including sharing of cost of the project, which was estimated at around 30 billion US dollars or 2 lakh crore rupees. In fact, India and Russia had signed an intergovernmental agreement for the mega project in 2007. However, as per news reports, the project has been stuck for the last 11 years over serious differences between the two sides on sharing costs of developing the jet, technologies to be used in it, and number of aircrafts to be produced over the years. So what have been the reasons behind the project going on back burner? What are the features of FGFA and how can it augment the strength of the Indian Air Force and possible ways perhaps to revive the project at a later stage. For a detailed discussion on this, today we are joined with a distinguished panel of guests in the studio. Let me start by introducing them to you, beginning with the retired Lieutenant General V.K. Saxena, former DG Army Air Defense and a distinguished fellow of VIF. Uh, we have with us uh, Saikar Datta, uh, a well-known uh, defense journalist and uh, nowadays South Asia editor of Asia Times. Uh, we also have with us uh, retired uh, Air Vice Marshal Kapil Kak, uh, founding additional director of Center for Air Power Studies, that is CAPS. Welcome all of you to Rajya Sabha TV studios. Uh, let me begin with you, uh, Air Vice Marshal Kak, uh, straight away asking, is this something which was expected, uh, that is uh, putting this project on back burner, or this is something which has happened over the years uh, and there was no way out? A combination of both, Vishal. Uh, the manner in which it panned out, starting with what you referred to an intergovernmental agreement in 2007, at which point $295 million were transferred to Russia for a preliminary research and development phase contract. This was to be followed by a final uh, design and con uh, development phase which was to take place in 2012, five-year gap. But since then, last six years, no one has seen the light of the day in terms of the finalization of the R&D contract, which is the heart of the issue. The second uh, point that you mentioned, we could elaborate on, on this later, is there were some problems from our side, some problems from the Russian side. From our side, we did many yo-yos on the numbers of aircraft. We started with uh, Mr. Anthony announcing something like 200 and 250 uh, aircraft. Then ballparks were changed and then we went to 127, which stuck at one time. We were even talking about 65 flyaways. That was last year. On the Russian side, unfortunately, uh, the problem was more serious. And that's what has prob most likely grounded this project. Uh, they were not willing to share uh, knowledge on the technologies of this aircraft, uh, the nature of the work share, which in our case was just 13, 13%, when we paid 50% of the development cost as we began the project. Uh, source codes were not forthcoming. Uh, the other difficult area was mm -hmm. there was no learning curve. This was not a Make in India project. It could never be. Aircraft has been designed, developed, it's been test flown, there are prototypes which are flying. And so what would we bring to the basket of technology sharing between Russia and us, other than some very, very limited kind of production manufacturing technology capabilities? Last point I'd like to suggest is also trust. I think in between uh, they collaborated with UAE, uh, without, we were the only partners for them. We also need to know this project came in at a time when there were some major international order swings going on. Let me explain what that means. Mm -hmm. We had invested a, a lot in that landmark defense cooperation framework agreement signed by then uh, Defense Minister Pranab Mukherjee, 2005. It changed the complete dynamics of global order. Second, followed it up with 
civil nuclear cooperation. So it perceptionally and in terms of optics, India was seen to be going close towards the US with the induction of C-90 transport aircraft, C-130, absolutely the most fascinating aircraft on world in its class with the kind of capabilities, I have said this on Rajya Sabha mm -hmm. TV, yes. land this aircraft on a dark night in rain in two football lead, uh, length field with 100 people getting out. A classical special. So that, that perception also played that, a part. So something had to be done. So this became very handy. So there was, there was more eagerness on part of the political and executive establishment rather than the Indian Air Force. Okay. But eventually they went along. Okay. But at the end of it all, I think DRDO has put the trump card that whatever we are getting in this technology, we already have that capability or we are developing that capability. Yes. Why do you want to go through this costly induction when we can develop this in indigenously with our kind of capability? And this fits up with our grand strategy of uh, operational, technological, aerospace capability in an extremely uncertain and fragile global order. Okay. And this is extremely important because Xi Jinping himself said last year, I think, 2025 make in China plan, aerospace is number one. Okay. So, so this is a precursor of our doing what Xi Jinping said a year, a year and a half. Back. Okay, so you, uh, you've summed it uh, aptly, the entire, uh, you know, perspective in which we have to look at uh, this projected. We now bring in uh, Lieutenant General Saxena on this. Uh, and let's take all those points which have been pointed out by uh, a Vice Marshal Kark one by one. Uh, begin with the, the uh, you know, uh, features of uh, this aircraft. Let's, let's, let's talk about because uh, he okay. more or less focused on how the technology transfer was a very key contentious issue. So when we look at the technology aspect, uh, is that something which was uh, you would consider the major cause of concern for India, and that might have led uh, for India to go ahead and you know rethink on its association with this project? Absolutely right, you are. If you start your journey from December 2010, I'll take you back there, when the MOU was signed between the uh, Hindustan Aeronautics Limited and the RB and Sukhoi, there was a specific point of agreement. First was that it is a joint study and development of a fifth generation fighter aircraft in which what will happen? 50-50% funding, number one. Number two, the funding, engineering and the intellectual property will be shared 50-50%. That is the start point of the whole issue. Now from there, there have been four casualties as the air, air marshal just brought out. The four casualties start, casualty number one is work share. We, as per the agreement, started to ask for critical software, the mission computer, the, co the cockpit display system, the navigation system, and the countermeasure dispensation system, which was part of the critical technology. Mm -hmm. There were right from the beginning issues in sharing that technology. Now, in November, September 2016, when the detailed work share agreement was signed, there was a little bit of displeasure. Why was the displeasure? Because in the R&D sector that time, we were only getting 15% of the R&D share and much less than 50% of the work share, but sharing the cost 50-50%. So first casualty is work share. Second casualty is the cost. Air Marshal already brought out. Now starting, it was 6 billion, 6 billion. When we said our work share is so less and our R&D is so less, they tried to reduce the cost to 3.7 billion for the Indian scene. But when we started asking for the critical technologies, source code, mm -hmm. uh, computer co codes, mm -hmm. they said, sorry, for this you require $7 billion, which is, became the cost casualty. Third time, third casualty was a time casualty. How was the time casualty? Now in 2010, it was said eight to 10 years for development. Mm -hmm. And therefore, 2018, we should have seen the light of the day. So certification itself is 2019, another three years to give, 2022 to 23, the aircraft won't be there. Then of course the number casualty which sir has already brought out. Starting, I'll go a step behind. The uh, uh, Deputy, uh, Deputy Foreign Minister of Russia, Mr. Borisov, at that time said, 1,000 aircraft, you know, 200 for uh, Russia, 200 for India, 600 for export. That is the type of market. Then we came down to 250 for Russia, 127, 144, then 127. And latest figure is looking at the status of this aircraft. Russia said we want only 18 to 24. Rest will develop SU-35. 
Now I go along with the Air Force fully and fully and 100% in mm -hmm. their assessment of suboptimality of this aircraft. Okay. What are the suboptimality? The first greatest suboptimality of this aircraft is underpowered engine, sir. Now the engine of this aircraft is Saturn AL 41 F1S. It develops a thrust of only 32,500 pounds. This thrust is not sufficient for two major things which define a fifth generation fighter aircraft. That are super cruise and super maneuverability. What is super maneuverability? Super maneuverability is the capability of the aircraft to carry out maneuvers so, beyond the capability uh -huh. of aerodynamic forces. Okay. With this it cannot do. Uh, because so so, so this, was, this was definitely, I, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll cut you in here because uh, uh, Sekat uh, would, uh, you know, will, would want to bring Sekat on the issue of cost and, and the engine part is definitely a very important one. That is also a crucial one which, uh, you know, uh, most of uh, the critics have uh, written as well. Uh, but, uh, you know, since both of you have spoken about cost as well, let me bring uh, Sekat on the cost aspect. Sekat, uh, if you look at the cost aspect here, then in terms of cost specifically, uh, you know, the projections uh, came around somewhere around $250 million for one aircraft by the time this project would have been executed. That is something which was an exorbitant one. So apart from the critical tech transfer and other issues with the uh, aircraft development, uh, it was the cost as well which you believe might have played a very important role. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I agree with what A.Y. Marshall Kark pointed out, in terms of costs, this would have never really worked for us. And the key thing is, why would you want to spend money from a perspective planning? The real reason is that you need to have the technology. And unless you don't own the technology, like as General Saxena also pointed out, if you mm -hmm. don't have the source codes, if you don't have the critical technologies for which India was expected to cough up the money, and if they're not willing to share that, then this is almost like a dead investment because then we would have continued being in a buyer seller relationship where they would continue to sell aircraft and instead and because we have already put in so much of money India would have become a cap I mean would have been captured as a market and we would have no option to go anywhere else because we've already invested so much so I mean the pulling out was inevitable and it had to be pulled out at this stage because if you had gone on sinking more money into this we would have been trapped into a really bad deal Okay, uh, going uh, to the technological aspect of it and specifically something which, uh, uh, you know, uh, General Saxena was pointing out, uh, that is the engine part of it. Uh, one thing which has been pointed out by several critics is that uh, these, uh, you know, uh, aircrafts which were being developed uh, they, uh, at the development stage, they did not have a modular engine uh, uh, format, as in that would have, le you know, led uh, in a lot of cost uh, uh, ad addition in terms of uh, maintenance of the aircraft. So that would have been uh, uh, difficult for uh, Indian Air Force because uh, Indian Air Force has already raised concerns over uh, other Sukhois it, ha it has uh, in terms of their maintenance. No, no, precisely. Uh, the problem was the maintainability of these platforms. But on the question of uh, the power plant, uh, the Russians in the last two years had said by 2018, which is now, or maybe it gets deferred by uh, a short period, that they would up-engine the, the FGFA that they have in uh, place for their own Air Force. Uh, regrettably, even the Russian Air Force doesn't have the FGFAs yet, whereas you have FGFAs like the F-22 and the F-35 flying in the United States. You have the uh, the J-20 and the J-31 in China. These are the equivalents with whom we were to establish a kind of uh, symmetry in capabilities as great powers of the next two decades or so. So are you riding that techno-operational trajectory as a power? Uh, the cost one, I think i like to bring, I mean, this was a very specific question. Uh, I'd like to answer it very, very specifically. We paid the Russians, let me say it in crores, comes easy to our uh, viewers. We paid them 1800 crores when we signed the preliminary R&D contract. Thereafter, the cost that we are looking at in terms of recent arrangements between the two governments is that we would pay them 45,000 crores uh, as costs of development. Now, this is not a large figure. But look at the fine print. Apart from this, we were to pay 900 crores for every aircraft that we order. 
and we were talking about 127. Now, if you do a rough ballpark figure, this comes to something like 160,000 crores for 127 aircraft. This almost touches 2,000 crores an aircraft. Mm -hmm. I don't think the Air Force would be able to afford it, number one. Number two, the question of maintainability. You uh, rightly mentioned the modular design of the engine. We are not sure how the new upgraded engine would fit into the maneuverability aspect John Saxena has brought out. Don't forget the stealth is essentially not a question of putting paint on an aircraft so it doesn't actually have a radar signature on a, uh, on a radar. It is to design it as a stealth platform. And that's why the F-22, the F-35 uh, in the US, the J-20, the J-31, they are designed from a scratch. Mm -hmm. There have been stealth problems on this, on the design angle by itself. Okay. Lastly, lastly, what we are missing out in this narrative is the very huge complexities of our own riding the technological capability curve because of the pressures put on us on the LCA uh, program, development of composites, our ability to now bring out a fairly decent AISA radar, mm -hmm. which for which we need a little assistance, and that has been very astutely built into our, uh, our program for the additional aircraft for which the RFI, the re request for information, has been issued very, very recently, mm -hmm. but unfortunately with the electoral cycle, cycle kick kicking in, there could be some delay in the finalization of what would be those uh, vendors who will okay. supply it. But the critical point is, as we understand today, one of the key elements is that the vendor who will produce those 110 additional combat aircraft in the medium category would per force have to part with exactly what John Saxena said, source codes, radar capability, Critical technology. detailed. I mean, I don't want to bore the viewers with detailed technicalities, but to give us the real technological know-how and know why. Not know-how as much as know why. Because that's where you come into the source codes and the designs and everything, so that we can write the AMCA program on our own with very little assistance that, from that, outside. That, 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 uh, that uh, brings me uh, to uh, another question uh, to uh, General Saxena, and it has been said uh, by uh, you know several uh, experts and several news reports as well, that one last uh, uh, you know, push which finally uh, you know, made uh, the India say that, okay, fine, as of now, will not be part of this project, was from the DRDO, which said that, uh, eventually which said that, uh, well, over a period of time, over uh, we will be able to go ahead and develop this kind of technology indigenously. So it doesn't make any sense to go in for such an exorbitant, uh, uh, you know, exorbitantly uh, priced uh, product uh, and buy it from elsewhere. Sir, very right. You know, the biggest suboptimality which we have been talking about, but not yet in detail, is the suboptimality of this aircraft in the stealth design. You know, what is the, this aircraft is boasting of internal weapon base two of the internal weapon bays under the fuselage and two more triangular close to the end of the fuselage. But the point is that two missiles, one is the subsonic anti-ship missile, another is a BrahMos A missile. These cannot be fitted inside those weapon bays and the strong points have to be put outside and there will be the biggest giveaway. You know, the experts are calling this aircraft a dirty aircraft. From stealth wise, a dirty aircraft. Number two. The only the frontal portion of the aircraft has got stealth, that is the front stealth. And one of the experts has written in open source that the rear part of this aircraft actually looks like a truck. And thirdly, <laughs> the precision tolerances which are required to make, you know, in F-35 trials were going on, stealth trial was going on. In the 17 trials they carried out, they could not check out why the aircraft is getting detected. And only after a lot of trials, they found out there's a small little screw hanging out from a cantilever, which is making this aircraft uh, uh, detectable. You know, that sort of a precision is required. 
Now you're talking about that precision which is not there. Yes, it is a big aircraft, a sturdy aircraft, a very strong landing gear, it's got a nose, everything, but the precision which is required in the stealth. You know the stealth, just let me compare the stealth portion of it. A stealth of an F-22 or a 35 RCS, radar cross-sectional signature, is 0 0.001 meter square, whereas this is 0 0.1 1 meter square, huge, huge difference. Now, when you say to DRDO, now I turn your attention back okay. to AMCA. You know what is AMCA? This medium combat aircraft which we are building up is got most of the features which we are either having in this mm -hmm. or we are going to develop in a period of time. Okay. It has got super cruise, it has got super maneuverability, it has also got an engine which has got adequate power, not underpowered. It has got engine which is modular in design. Yes, we are not that superior as F-22, we are not as superior as F-35, but we are on the way. When this aircraft is suboptimal, when this aircraft is so suboptimal in terms of, okay, uh, Air Marshal pointed out about the new engine, SDLay 30. It's going to come out only in 2020, and there is a latest report which says it is a delay of one and a half to two years more. So, so, so there, there, there is a delay there, was, uh, there, yes. there as well, but it looks like that, you know, what DRDO is saying is, is possible. Let me bring in uh, Saikat as well here, uh, and we're running short of time. Saikat, uh, as far as, uh, you know, developing indigenous technologies are concerned, uh, is that, uh, you know, a logical way to go ahead and say that, okay, over a period of time, we can go ahead and develop it ourselves, given the stage or the you know uh, requirement which we have as far as Indian Air Force is concerned. We are running very much behind the schedule. There are very less number of squadrons we have, but we need the technology as well. See, uh, let me quick story. In 2006 or 7, I had gone to Hindustan Aeronautics Limited, and I was on the shop floor where the LCA was being built. And they had certain projections of when the initial operation clearance will be given and when the final operation clearance will be given. And that was in 2007 and apparently in the next two to three years those things are. Now we are looking at 2019 and we still haven't reached the final operation clearance. So the problem here is that indigenization and there is no doubt in my mind is the way forward. Until and unless a country becomes a producer of technology itself, it will never be able to be counted among the big nations of the world. But that can only be achieved when there is a certain, you know, all the factors come together, both at the political level, at the forces level, and at the technological level, where everybody comes in sync. Because everyone right now seems to be uh, being pulled by very different kind of forces. So while the political setup has their own considerations, technology has its own, and the military has their own, there is no coherence in that mm -hmm. uh, discussion. So unless and until that happens, and unfortunately the LCA has not been giving enough uh, progress which will give a lot of confidence to our, you know, the people who have to manage the battlefield, people who have to fight their wars. So unless and until that is not rectified, we will always be in this situation where either we'll be hostage to a bad deal like what has happened with the Russians, or we'll be, I mean, we'll have to hanker after technology which comes from the West, but it comes at a tremendous geopolitical cost. Okay. Uh, uh, Air Vice Marshal Kaka, the final and the important, most important question is uh, that in a situation like this, one, do you see a way out to revive a project of this kind, given the fact that there are claims or there are statements which say that DRDO has said in, that it is possible to develop these indigenously, and as Sekhat is pointing out, uh, indigenization is the way forward. Second, how can that be juxtaposed with the needs of the Indian Air Force, uh, given its present condition? Okay, uh, I think uh, the first point is important. It is the critical shortages of the Indian Air Force in combat squadron strength. Now, that is partly sorted out by the 36 aircraft coming in from France, starting next year onwards. In three years, we'll have those. The second is this uh, RFI which has been issued and that is a very critical requirement on, if only for beefing up what has been discussed here as the AMCA program. I think for once Indian Air Force cannot be faulted. It is generally faulted. You don't support the indigenization. Now in this case Indian Air Force and DRDO are on the same page. Unfortunately the point that Saikat has made most of the oxygen in the narrative is taken by the silo functioning of these. And if our AMCA has to see the light of the day sooner rather than later, I think the political authority, the executives, 
the DRDO, the production agencies and the users have to come together. And I think that program, I, I dare say, must be entrusted to a program director who's from the Indian Air Force. Because user alone knows that's been our experience in the, in the LCA. Because else Air Force has been kept so far apart from the decision-making loop that you don't have a LCA today, even after 30 years since it was conceptualized. But may, let me make the last point. Mm -hmm. The last point is on AMCA. Unless we have this edifice ready, and it is driven personally by the Prime Minister of India, he won't be the first Prime Minister. Prime Ministers in the past have steered the LCA program. I think the way forward is that, let us have the fastest. Uh, the point General Saxena made was somewhat over-optimistic. We still don't have a, uh, a, a project definition phase of the AMCA. That is the basic, fundamental issue for which we've been struggling last two, three years. Okay. That must come in. Feasibility must be proven. The arms must get together. And I think I am, for example, I'm not sorry that the FGFA with the Russians has come to a ground, uh, grinding halt. I'm glad it has happened because it will only spur us more to enter the list of great powers in the world with our own technological trajectory riding national interest, safeguarding our national interest and what is more important, okay. giving us the capability for conventional deterrence and should that conventional deterrence fail, to be able to do war fighting in which we come the winner and nothing in today's war fighting is possible unless the okay. air power is exercised in the manner it's requires to be exercised. Okay, so clearly as our panelists have uh, pointed out in uh, this discussion that uh, as far as uh, the way forward is concerned, it is uh, the indigenization. But for that, all the stakeholders will have to come together, put up a united front, understand each other's requirement and move ahead. We'll come back again next week with a different topic and different set of guests. You can also catch this show on our YouTube channel and we will come back with a different topic next week as well. Keep watching Rajaswa Television.